Welcome to this video lecture for Understanding Project Management, a Practical Guide, Second Edition. This is Chapter 9, Risk Planning. So let's get started. As usual, this is our project life cycle. We are uh, continuing our journey through the planning processes that take place early in a project. And in this video lecture, we're going to look at the planning for project risk. So this is an important area of planning. And it's basically looking at what are the things that could go wrong during a project and what can we do about it? That brings us to our agenda, which is exactly that. What first question, what can go wrong during the project? And the second question is how can the risks that are identified be effectively managed? So what can we do about them? Rather than just let them happen, be a victim of risks, we can attempt to manage those risks and, and to be able to uh, live effectively with them during the project. So on the first question, what can go wrong during the project? The first step is to consider everything that could possibly go wrong. Um, and this is one where uh, more is better. This is a point in the project where um, the minds of the project team and others should be open to what could go wrong, even things that um, are not even considered likely or even, you know, even possible at all. Like those are sometimes the ones that that do crop up. Risk may be identified through a number of ways. Um, discussions with various stakeholders. There's different points of view. Reviewing the project scope to see just understanding what is going to be done can offer clues to what could go wrong and research into previous uh, or similar projects to say, well, what happened during those projects? Now, you know, sometimes risks are new and have never happened before, but oftentimes there are similar things that may have happened in the past. Um, and this is, a, again, I, I stress, this is a point in the project where, um, you know, really think about what are all the potential things? Leave no stone unturned in this area. Um, once risks are identified, then they should be assessed according to the two, these two factors. Uh, the first is how likely is it that this risk will occur? What is the probability? Is it very, is it somewhat likely? Is it could happen? Is it, you know, very, very unlikely, almost impossible? Those are, that sort of assessment needs to be made. Now, this is difficult. This is, this is something that's a risk is something that could happen in the future. It, it isn't happening now. Uh, and so assessing the probability is difficult because we don't know for sure, uh, but we still need to do it. The other, the other dimension or factor that we need to assess is that if it does occur, if the risk does come to pass, what will be the impact on the project? What will the likely um, cost or impact or, or disadvantage be if that risk occurs for the project? Um, now, I should uh, stop at this point and just, and just talk about there are both positive risks uh, and negative risks. Um, that are possible. A, 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 a positive risk is referred to as an opportunity. Um, during this video lecture, we're going to we're going to focus on the negative risks, the things that um, would be detrimental to our project. Now, this probability and impact may be described qualitatively, which is commonly, this is the way often, even as I was expressing it just a, a, a minute or so ago, was a qualitative description. That is, we can say things like high, medium, low, you know, likely, unlikely, very likely. That's, those are qualitative ways of describing um, 
the probability and impact is, is those sort of, uh, you know, sort of more or less subjective descriptions. Or they may be described quantitatively, such as a 10% probability or a $10,000 impact. That's a quantitative um, um, way of describing uh, the probability and impact. Now, um, both have their advantages and disadvantages. Um, the qualitative approach is probably, is arguably easier to do, is more natural, uh, because there's kind of a built-in fuzziness in terms of, of, of what that means, of what does high mean, and what does medium mean, and what does low mean. And, and that's where, uh, when qualitative um, assessments are made, oftentimes there is description that is associated with it, with it is to say, well, what, what are the bounds of each, of each uh, um, um, of these three terms? Um, but their built-in sort of inaccuracy is one of the disadvantages of them. Whereas the quantitative approaches, they're very succinct and accurate, like they're, they're not accurate, but they're, they're very succinct and, and understandable. 10%, we know what 10% means, it's one in 10. Uh, we know what a $10,000 impact is. Uh, the disadvantage is, is that there is an implied level of accuracy here that may not exist when you are when you are assessing probability and impact. To say that it's 10%, you know, that oftentimes teams are uncomfortable saying 10%. They they, you know, they don't know. So they're, you know, they're they're it's difficult for that. Or a ten thousand dollar impact, oftentimes there are um costs which are hard to um quantify if there's a if there's a cost of you know impact to a company's reputation well what is the dollar impact of that it's hard to quantify that you know you can you know there you can go and, and come up with dollar estimates but it's very difficult so um quantitative um estimating is is difficult to do because the, oftentimes the numbers just aren't available uh, and that makes teams un, uncomfortable this this course combines quality the, the aspects of qualitative and quantitative uh, into the assessment of probability and impact as follows um, when assessing and estimating the probability there are three um, there there are three, um, uh, qualitative categories, likely, possible, and unlikely. So those, those three, that, those are the only three that are allowed. It, it limits the, the, the choices into those three. And then a factor is assigned to each that if, if the team selects likely, then a probability factor of 0.8 is assigned. Uh, if possible, then a probability factor of 0.5 is assigned and unlikely 0.2. Now, it's important to note here is that these probability factors are not the, um, is, is not a percentage. So it's not saying that if it's, if you say likely that you're saying it's 80% versus possible is 50% versus unlikely is 20%. It's not saying that. Right, so don't don't assess those as as um, as as um, percentages. Otherwise, it'd be very unlikely we would uh, get a lot of likely probabilities because eighty percent is a pretty high bar. is a, is very like is 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 almost certain to happen. Um, so these are these are factors that are that are put on them. Likely or, or similarly, the impact follows a similar pattern where the um, project team will select whether it is critical, severe, moderate, or low impact. And the textbook has a, a description of what critical means, what severe means, what moderate means, and what, what low means. And then an impact factor is assigned, 10, 8, 5, and 2. And it's just, it's, it's, a, it's a number that's assigned to it. So we see now the conversion from qualitative to quantitative. And then what that allows us to do is that for each risk, 
once the probability factor is selected and the impact factor is, is selected, we can multiply those together to come up with a risk score to assign, to attach to each risk. For example, if we had a possible, a risk that was defined as possible, that would be 0.5, um, and the impact was severe, what, which is eight, we would take 0.5 multiplied by eight and have a risk score of four. And so that would allow us to to assign four to that risk. What this then does, allows us to do then, is to have risk scores assigned to every risk, and then we can sort the risks from highest to lowest. The higher the risk score, the more severe, the more, the more uh, dangerous the risk is. For example, the highest possible risk score is 0.8 times 10 is eight. The lowest possible risk score is uh, 0.2 times 2, right, which would be 0.4. So you see the broad range that allows you to really identify your, your most, your most the, the harshest, most dangerous risks are, are the ones with the high risk score. Okay, so let's, now we're going to move to our, our um, case study video. Which is, which is from the textbook. And we're going to watch what our project manager is now going to start to do about, about risks. So let's watch this together. Sophie has gathered her project team together to plan for possible risks. She calls the meeting to order. I've called the meeting today so that we as a team can plan for what could go wrong during the DecoCam version 4 product launch project. We've had a lot of problems on other projects recently. I think if we put some additional focus on risk management, we can reduce the number of problems for this project. Fadijet, the team's business analyst, leans forward in his chair. I hear you, Sophie but many things that have happened in the past were outside of our control. What could we do about it anyways? Fair enough, Fadigit, but even for these issues, it would be useful for us to have a backup plan. And I bet there are many potential problems that are well within our control. We want to prevent them from ever happening. Sophie then hands out a few blank cards to each team member. She asks each person to write down as many potential problems as they can. While the team may be tempted to eliminate ideas, it is best to allow for an open flow of ideas and not filter anything at this point. Within a few minutes, a number of completed cards are scattered across the table. Sophie writes each risk on the whiteboard. Sophie and the project team proceed to discuss and plan for each risk in detail. This includes creating a longer description of each risk as well as selecting the probability factor and impact factor of each risk. Then they calculate the risk score for each risk and put them in order from the highest score to the lowest. Okay, so we saw a number of things happening during that, that video. The project team we saw identifying as many risks as possible. You saw a technique there where the project manager, Sophie, handed out uh, different cards to each team member and, and got them all to write them down. It's a way of, of gathering feedback from people without being influenced by what others are saying. And that's what you, you really want to get is everyone's thoughts on this, because sometimes there's one person in the room that is thinking about something that you want to make sure that you get that out. Using the probability and impact tables, as we discussed previous, previously, a probability factor and risk factor is determined, determined resulting in a risk score for each risk. And that is placed in a document uh, known as the risk register. And you can see this risk register in chapter nine. If you, if you refer to chapter nine of the textbook, you will see all of the risks with the risk score sorted from the highest risk to the lowest risk. Uh, you want to, you know, ultimately 
focus on the highest, most dangerous risks first, uh, because those are the ones that are going to be potentially most detrimental um, to the uh, to the project. So again, key idea, identify and analyze the project risks according to their probability and impact. This now brings us to the, the next question and, the, and a very important question. This is what we're trying to get to is, okay, now we have this list of things that could go wrong, sorted in order from highest to lowest. Now, what do we do about them? And so how can the risks be managed? And in order to address, address risks before they occur, certain actions may be taken. Um, these are called risk response strategies. Now, the name is deceiving because risk response seems to imply to many that, well, let's wait and see what happens and then we'll respond to the risk. Well, that's, that's the opposite of what it really is. It's a risk response strategy is the response to the risk before it occurs, while it's still a risk in that risks are things that haven't happened yet. So it's your response to the presence of the risk. So keep that in mind that this is, it, it, it hasn't happened yet. It may never happen, but it's your response to those. Now, there are a number of different risk response strategies that are, um, that, that are, are, are available. And these are documented in the course uh, textbook. And it ranges from, this is the consideration, what are the five different types? It ranges from acceptance to mitigation. Mitigation is to um, do something, to change a process, to add some additional activity that is designed to reduce the probability or impact of the risk. So, so basically, uh, you know, change something in the conditions to hopefully, or to design to lower the probability or impact. Uh, there's risk avoidance, which is to remove, basically be able to completely remove the conditions that are causing that risk to be present, usually by reduction of, you know, elimination of, of something from the scope. Risk transfer, which is to transfer the risk to another party, usually in the form of, of um, uh, uh, insurance is a, is a form of risk transfer. You're, you're transferring risk to an insurance company or organization or waivers or certain contract conditions can transfer risk to, a, to another party. Um, or there's another, which is risk es escalation, which is to escalate. If it's beyond the scope of your project, it can be escalated to uh, a, another, um, you know, a person or entity within your organization. So basically more or less moved out of the scope of your project again. Uh, much more description of this in the textbook. So this is, that was a very high level overview. Um, not all of the, not all of those risk responses completely eliminates the risk from the project. In fact, only one, you know, ultimately only one of them does it, which is the risk avoidance, where it's completely removed from the scope. Um, normally, there is some risk remaining, so that you do you, the the probability and impact does not um, go to zero, and so any remaining risk that remains after performing the risk response strategy is called residual risk, the remaining risk that, that, is, that is still there after all those, after those actions. Um, the other um, activity that takes place during risk planning is to consider the actions, the action or actions that are to be taken if the risk that actually does occur Right, so this is, you know, kind of the opposite of risk response. This is called contingency planning. So that if, despite all your actions, despite your risk response planning, it still happens, what are you going to do now? And this is the planning for those for for those things of, of what will be done. Now it's important. Some may ask, well, why would I do that? Why don't I just wait until it occurs? Well, sometimes if you wait, it's it's too late to to be able to um, 
adequately handle it because there might be some things you had to prepare in advance. The other is while the um, the the risk is occurring, while what when when the problem is present, oftentimes there's not enough time to consider you know a, a, an optimal way to handle it at that point because the stress levels are high and things are going wrong. So it's not the best time to think about contingency while the problem is occurring. So it's best to consider contingency plans ahead of time. Again, before the risk occurs, you think about, well, what will I do if the risk does occur? Okay, let's go back to our uh, video. We will now see the, cons the consideration of how to uh, manage risks. So we'll just watch this together. Sophie looks at the list of risks and prepares to address the project team. I don't want any of these risks to occur during the project. So is there anything we can do now to make them less of an issue later on? The team decides that no additional actions are needed for the low priority risks. For the other risks, they make a list of additional actions that they could perform that will help lessen the seriousness of the risks. For one risk, risk number eight, the translation of the promotional video to other languages, they decide that the risk of problems is too high and they recommend that the requirement be removed from the project scope. Another risk, risk number three, is escalated to Arun for discussion with the senior management team. Next, the team considers each risk and considers what actions should be taken if the risk occurs and what would trigger these actions during the project. Sophie records the minutes of the meeting, ensuring that the activities discussed are accurately documented. Okay, so again, we saw the risk response and contingency plans being created. Sophie adds this information to the risk register. So we saw the risk register being uh, initially created, containing the description of the risk, the probability, the impact, and the risk score. Then what is added is a complete description of the risk response plan for each for each risk. So whether uh, you know whether it was going to be accepted, mitigated, avoided, transferred, or escalated, and a description of how that would be done. You know, not just that one word, but a, but a complete description of how, for example, how the risk would be mitigated. Um, you know, or why the risk would be accepted as a as another. And then as, as well, a complete description of the contingency plan for each risk, including the conditions that would trigger the contingency plan. And that's an important one because oftentimes risks are starting to become visible and, and there starts to be warning signs that it's about to appear, but it's, it's, it can be sometimes a judgment of whether and when you need to start um, declaring it active and triggering the contingency plan. So this is this is a, a description of what that would mean, of, of how the the contingency plan would be triggered and put into effect. And so that's documented in the in the uh, um, risk register. So key idea: determine the risk response and contingency plan for each risk. And again, uh, I direct you to the uh, chapter nine of the text, which demonstrates the risk response and con contingency plans that were created for each risk in the, uh, in the ongoing case study. The following uh, is a list of key terms that were introduced during this video lecture, um, which you can find out more information about them in the key terminology section in chapter nine, and a list of references for any images used in this presentation. So this is the end of the video uh, lecture for chapter nine.